Anyway, with that, our session this morning is the structure and function of the host associated in microbial communities. And our first speaker is Brendan Bohannon, who is Professor of Environmental Studies and Biology and Director of the Institute of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Oregon. He is a founding member of the Microbial Ecology and Theory of Animals Center for Systems Biology an NIH Center of Excellence focused on the application of ecological theory to host microbe systems, and the Biology and the Built Environment Center, which is a national center for the study of microbial ecology of buildings. He's been a member of the Europe, University of Oregon faculty since 2006, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Quest. I want to thank uh, David and the forum for the opportunity to talk today. It's a great honor to be here, especially for someone who for some reason, still feels a little bit outside the microbiome community. So David has been slowly bringing me in over the last year. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about today is uh, some recent work that we've done in applying concepts from general ecology to host-associated microbes. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how, how um, plant and animal ecologists think about uh, communities and how they assemble through time and how we can use some of these ideas to inform how we study um, assembly of communities uh, within hosts. So before I get into that, I want to give you a little, little bit of background about what my motivation is for the kind of work I want to talk about today. I'm getting some feedback here. Is this, can you all hear me on the microphone? Good. Okay. So to me as an ecologist, one of the most amazing and fascinating things about the human microbiome is the variation that's present across individuals. And Marty Blazer gave a great example, a couple of wonderful examples of that sort of variation. This is a figure from one of the papers that he talked about uh, yesterday um, from the Yassisenko yes paper. And what this shows is on the x-axis is a measure of community dissimilarity. The y-axis is comparisons of children against uh, uh, other members of their families, their communities. So monozygotic twins, zygotic twins, siblings, mothers, fathers compared to different children. And what I take away from a diagram like this, and there are many now in the literature, is that there's an extraordinary amount of variation among individuals, even very closely related individuals that live in the same home. The, my, the microbes associated with me are very different than those of David, different than those of my brother, and even my twin. And I find this amazing, this level of, of a variation in communities across individuals. And to me, one of the most important questions to address is where all this variation comes from. And there's a couple of reasons why I think this is particularly interesting. So, so one is that it seems like it's, answering this question is key to addressing many very important questions about host-associated microbes. It's key to, to um, understanding the relationship between microbial communities and health and disease. It's key to our ability to predict the dynamics of communities within hosts. And it's essential if um, we're going to develop strategies for managing or even restoring microbial communities within hosts, but to understand why we all differ so much in our microbiome. And another reason why I think this is particularly fascinating is this is a fundamental ecological question. The ecologists of all stripes are interested in this question plant, animal, microbial, otherwise. This is one of the, the big questions in ecology is why we see such variation from place to place in the species that are, that are present. And, and plant and animal ecologists in particular have been thinking about the sources of variation in communities for a very long time. So there's a number of us who have uh, drawn on, on ideas from plant and animal ecology to help guide our studies of uh, variation in host-associated microbial communities. And that's what I want to talk about. So my talk will have two parts. The first part, I'm going to give you kind of an introduction to the way plant and animal ecologists think about the drivers of community variation. So some of you, this will be a review, but I know this is a broad audience, so I want to make sure we're all on the same page about how ecologists think about community variation. Um, and David alluded to some of those processes in his, um, his summary earlier. And in the second half of my talk, I want to give you an example of how I've been uh, conducting experiments along with Karen Gilman in the zebrafish system. Uh, that are inspired by ideas from plant and animal ecology. Hopefully that will spur some discussion about uh, this approach. Okay. So there are many different processes in, that could drive variation of communities from place to place, or across time, across hosts. And ecologists have organized these different processes in many different ways. David gave one breakdown kind of historical versus stochastic versus deterministic. But this is the simplest way that I've seen in the literature. I think simple is good. This is what I thought I would start my talk out with. And this is an idea of 
that Mark Vellin at the University of British Columbia came, came up with two years ago. Which is, he pointed out that over short time scale and at relatively coarse taxonomic resolution, if you really think about the processes that drive community variation, it's falling into so one of three categories. Either just, they're related to dispersal, what he calls ecological drift, or ecological selection. And what he means by this is that dispersal is just the movement of organisms across space. Drift is the stochastic loss of organisms and their replacement either from outside or from within the community. And ecological selection is the differential fitness among organisms. In fact, that some organisms grow better in some places and others grow better in other places. And this third uh, process, group of processes, ecological selection, is I think what most of us think about as driving community variation, at least within microbial communities. And so I think one of the biggest gifts that plant animal ecology has made in microbial ecology is to make us think about the possible roles of dispersal and drift in driving the variation we see in microbial communities in many different environments, including possibly in hosts, as, as David mentioned earlier. So these are... For some of you, I'm sure these are just words. So let me give you an example, some examples of how these different processes could drive community variation in microbial communities. And I'll get back to how, in just a moment, to how ecologists have tried to tease apart the relative contributions of these different kinds of processes. So let's start with a very simple kind of thought experiment. Imagine there's just four species in our imaginary world, <coughs> by these four colored shapes. That together they make up this gamish of possible colonists of, uh, of a particular habitat soil or ocean or host, and that given a, a, a new habitat, an island rising from the sea or a baby is born, um, you can think about how these processes might result in the assembly of communities across, across space. And one way that, that um, these processes can work is that environment can vary from place to place and act as a kind of filter. So that some organisms uh, survive better in some places, others in other places. Right? So the environment acts as a kind of template that imposes structure on it. Ecological selection by the environment. So ecological selection can also happen even if the environment doesn't vary from place to place. Um, but if by chance certain organisms arrive in an environment first, then through positive and negative interactions, they can encourage or discourage the uh, subsequent colonization by other types. This is also a kind of selection, but not by the environment, but by the community itself as it establishes over time. The so two ways that selection can work, but selection is not the only process to drive community variation. So, just to think about how dispersal might, might drive community variation in a simple scenario like this. So, the simplest way that dispersal can drive community variation is just through sampling. So, from a common possible pool of species like this to colonize the habitat, not everything can be everywhere all the time. And so, just the act, the, 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 act, the act of sampling from a pool can drive variation through stochastic process. And this can be magnified if the pools available for colonization of habitats are different from place to place. Yes. By my, the pool that can colonize me in Oregon is different from what we have here in Washington. That when we sample from those different pools, I can drive variation. So dispersal can work in these two different ways. And finally, there's this concept of ecological drift, which is difficult for some people, I think, to kind of appreciate, and it has the potential to be a very powerful driver of variation. And drift is just the stochastic loss of individuals from a community. And then the replacement, either through migration or reproduction. <coughs> and this plays out over time, and it can result in, in very striking pattern variation across communities, at least in plant and animal communities, ecological drift. So ecologists have also recognized that these processes play out in, usually in a kind of discontinuous landscape, where there are patches of habitat that are disconnected uh, physically, but connected through dispersal, what ecologists call a meta community. And a lot of effort is, but has gone on recently by plant and animal ecologists to try to understand how these processes interact across this, this discontinuous landscape. And so one, one thing that's assumed by plant and animal ecologists now is that these different kinds of processes interact to drive variation in any particular community. But what's not really understood is how they interact. Well, it's sort of understood. When you get statements like this, this is what Mark Bellin calls the sort of general theory of community ecology, which basically states that dispersal, ultimately diversification, but short time scales, dispersal brings organisms to a community. And then selection, drift, and ongoing dispersal then, then 
alters the relative abundances of the different types. So ultimately, this is what drives variation. This is true, but it's not very useful, right? Because what's really interesting is, is how drift and selection and ongoing dispersal interact to drive variation. So those different balances among those different forces um, predict different dynamics in communities and predict different ways that, that, would, that would be more useful and more, more um, uh, we're likely to work in terms of managing communities. So a lot of effort recently has gone into trying to understand how to, how to figure out the relative importance of these different processes. And this turns out to not be very easy. And ecology, plant animal ecology, is a good source of ways that we shouldn't do this, ways that have not been very effective in terms of asking this question. So I'm going to go through a couple of those to kind of set up the experiments that we're doing now in the zebra fish. So, so initially, plant and animal ecologists started to ask questions about community variation. Uh, they had the, this idea that you could look at patterns and distribution across space or time and infer from that the relative importance of these three kinds of processes, drift, dispersal, and selection. So uh, essentially, they, they argued you could use biogeographical patterns to, um, to make inferences about the relative importance of the process. And here's one example of such a pattern. This is one of the more um, common biogeographical patterns. It's been shown to be present for plants, animals, and microbes. This is just the idea that the similarity between two communities varies with how far apart they are. Communities are close together, they share more types. Communities farther apart share fewer types, the proportion of the total. This is called the distance decay relationship. And initially, this was thought to be an example of the importance of dispersal. But it's since been shown that this pattern and, and every other biogeographical pattern can be produced by different combinations of dispersal, drift, and selection. There's no definitive pattern that we can use. There's no way, for example, not likely that we can sample, continue to sample humans and their distribution, to micro, their microbiome, their distribution across humans, and actually be able to tell definitively whether the human microbiome is driven, variation in the microbiome is driven primarily by selection for drift or dispersal. So more recently, oops, more, more recently, ecologists have turned to trying to decompose these patterns in more detail for statistical rigor. So asking, for example, how much of this pattern is driven by changes in the environment across space. The fact that two places in space that are close together share more environmental characteristics than two that are farther apart. And to actually statistically decompose the amount of this relationship that can be explained by environment, by interactions between environment and geography, by geography. And people have, and microbial ecologists have done this as well. I've done some of this work myself. And this can give us some insight into the importance of current environmental conditions driving variation in communities. But it's really inadequate because in most cases, there's a little bit of variation explained by the environment, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent for plants, animals, or microbes. A little bit even less explained by geography, usually 10 or 20 percent. And then most of the variation we see in communities is in this unexplained category, which could be drift, it could be things, in aspects of the environment we haven't measured. And so this has really proven to be an inadequate way to try to get at the relative importance of these three kinds of processes. So what ecologists have turned to, plant and animal ecologists, in the last, well, three or four years is starting to, to, to make a plea that what we need to do is to combine these approaches with rigorous manipulative experiments, which makes sense, right? I mean, the most definitive way to separate these processes is to actually independently manipulate them. But this has been really disheartening for plant and animal ecologists because these experiments are difficult to do for them, difficult logistically, difficult to do with the scales of space and time that are really necessary to tease apart these different processes. But this is one place where, as microbial ecologists, we have an advantage. We can actually do these sorts of things. Maybe we can't do them in humans, at least not ethically, but we can do them in other organisms, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about this the rest of my talk today, how we might do these sorts of experiments to tease apart the relative importance of these three processes uh, using a, a host microsystem. And the system I want to talk about is my, my current favorite model, my super model as I call it, the zebra fish. And I think Karen's introducing me to, uh, to this, this super model. So Karen gave a great introduction yesterday to the advantages of the zebrafish as a model for studying 
close associated microbes. <coughs> and I want to just recap a few of the things that she said and why, for these questions in particular, excuse me, a very uh, powerful model system. So as Karen mentioned, the zebrafish, share, uh, zebrafish guts and immune system share some characteristics with humans. Uh, this, this system has advanced that we can manipulate the genetics of the host uh, with, with great power because it has been an uh, animal model and developmental biology for a very long time. So there are mutants, for example, that allow us to uh, turn off the adaptive immune system, allow us to interfere with the innate immune system. Uh, there's other ways we can manipulate the genetics. There's mutants that will, that, that, um, I don't have normal peristalsis, for example. So we can manipulate the host in power. It's also possible to manipulate the microbes associated with the host. So as Karen mentioned, we can raise these fish asynically, introduce specific microbes to colonize the, the guts of, of the zebrafish directly. <coughs> so we can manipulate both sides of, of the players, the host and the microbes. And from my perspective, there's three other advantages to the system that make it particularly powerful for asking the sorts of questions that I was just talking about. So one is that we can raise zebrafish asynically in large numbers and at relatively small cost, at least relative to mice. So we have the potential to have the statistical power to actually ask questions about community variation, which requires usually a great level of replication. You can also raise the fish in highly controlled environments. You can manipulate the environmental um, uh, components that, that might be driving uh, community variation. And we can raise them, because they're aquatic creatures, in a common source pool of potential colonists, okay? raised in the same tank or in the same water source that contains the same microbes that could potentially colonize the fish. So we have more, we have an extraordinary level of control and replication in this particular system. And right, so for the last uh, 10 minutes or so of my talk, I want to give you an example of one of the projects we've done, trying to tease apart the relative importance of these three kinds of processes using the zebrafish. And this is a longitudinal study that we're just completing where we Started, uh, uh, this, started this experiment with uh, a number of, of germ-free individual fish that were nearly isogenic, so uh, highly inbred uh, lines, siblings from a highly inbred line. And then we uh, exposed these germ-free fish to a kind of natural inoculum that occurs in the water in the rearing facility, which we raise the zebrafish. And then we watched or we tracked the colonization of the zebrafish gut across time. So in this diagram, it shows some of the major developmental uh, uh, milestones, zebrafish, from hatching and opening of the mouth, getting feeding, innate immunity, uh, the onset of adaptive immunity and sexual maturity. We sampled at six time points that span these developmental um, milestones. At each time point, we sampled 12 individual fish, uh, dissected the fish, removed their guts, extracted DNA, and then PCR amplified the V4 region of 16 s using 150 base pair paired in sequencing on the Illumina platform, for those of you who like these sorts of details. And from that, we, did, we came up with a putative ID of the bacteria that are present in the gut of the zebrafish. Right, so one of the first things that we saw is that, as Karen mentioned yesterday, we actually see great changes across developmental time, on average, in the composition of these communities. So the first two time points, four and 10 days post-fertilization, saw communities that were, on average, dominated by gamma proteobacteria, shifted in the middle developmental time points to communities dominated by alpha and beta proteobacteria. And then, but at the on, by the onset of sexual maturity, communities that had a significant component of fusobacteria. So we saw changes through time. And even more interesting to me, I think, the fact that we saw variation among individuals at the same developmental stage. This graph is on the y-axis is a measure of the difference among communities, uh, weighted unifrac, and the x-axis is age. And you can see there's a substantial variation at each time point, and there's a slight trend to increase the similarity across developmental time, the older fish being more different from each other on average than the younger fish. And so our, the question that we're faced with now is what's driving all this variation? And can we use these ideas from plant and animal ecology to try to make sense of what's driving this variation? So what we did was to basically take three approaches with this first experiment. We essentially reduced the, the contribution of two components to these processes, uh, the contribution toward variation, by using fish that 
that were uh, very highly similar genetically that removed the contribution host genetics to host selection. And then we used, we kept these fish co-housed with the same potential inoculum, so we reduced the contribution of sampling from different pools. That was the first thing we did, to try to experimentally reduce some of the processes that could contribute to variation. And then we used a null model that assumes just sampling from a, a common source pool and ecological drift to, to ask, well, what, com what component of the variation that we see across our individual fish could be explained just by sampling and just by drift? And then what's left should be due to host selection by factors that aren't directly coded for genetically, so the immune, uh, adaptive immune system, for example, or micro microbe interaction, that David was talking about earlier. And so let me talk in just a couple minutes about this null model that we used, and then I'll show you the data that we uh, generated. So we actually used two different null models, just because we didn't trust either one of these completely, so we wanted to see if we could confirm our results using two different approaches. And both of these null models assume just sampling from a common source pool and drift, no selection whatsoever. And the first is a model that was basically an extension of a, one of the first neutral models that was developed for plant communities. This was ex uh, extended and adapted for microbes, and the second was a kind of classic uh, neutral model that was developed by Ron Paul Etienne, a theoretical ecologist in France. And these gave us similar results. I'm just going to talk about the results for the, the Sloan model on the left. And so what this model does, very briefly, is assume the local community, in this case a fish, that's being colonized by microbes from this common source pool, and the dye is thrown at some time point an individual goes extinct in that fish, and then at some probability m, a migrant comes from outside. Some probability 1 minus m, reproduction happens on the inside. We get drift, and then dispersal from the outside, reproduction from the inside. And it's all that this model contains, just these simple processes. And that plays out over time, and that plays out over space, or over different individual fish. And so over time, this process of drift and dispersal can produce patterns in the distribution of taxa across the individual fish. At least it's predicted to. And one pattern that's particularly interesting, I think, is that is a pattern that, that develops between the frequency at which we detect any given taxon in fish, so how many fish we find a particular bacterium in, and its relative abundance in the source pool. Like the more abundant it is in the source pool, the more frequently we should find it across fish. It's a very basic ecological relationship called the range abundance relationship. And this model predicts a particular form of this relationship. And it looks like this. The y-axis, the frequency of detection, the x-axis, the relative abundance in the source community. And what's interesting about this pattern is that we can define the source community in a couple different ways that allow us to actually measure it. So one way we can define it is the average across local communities, so across all the individual fish. And this basically allows us to ask, of things that can live inside fish, what might be driving the variation? I want to talk in a couple minutes about results using that definition of, the, uh, of our, uh, of our uh, source community. All right, so here's one example of us fitting our data, this from the first time point to this model. And what we found, much to my surprise, is it explained what I think is an amazing amount of variation at this first time point. Over 80% of the variation could be explained by this very simple model. Each of these dots, again, is just a different OTU, a different taxon in the fish. It's frequency of detection and relative abundance. And this, the fit of this model doesn't definitively mean that these taxa have been um, uh, assembled within the fish solely through dispersal and drift, but what it means is we can't tell. We can't distinguish this, their assembly from the null model. It's consistent with the idea that they could be assembled just through dispersal and drift. And so one, thing, one of the things we can do with this model is ask does the fit of this model change through developmental time? And we found that it did. This is a graph of the fit of the model, variation explained over age of the fish. And we see this initially that the model explained a great deal of variation that dropped between dates four and day 10, rose a little bit, and then declined over time as the fish matured. So one way to interpret this is that the strength of selection relative to the strength of dispersal and drift um, increased over time between days age four and 10, increased or decreased slightly, and then increased again over time. And we're trying to, repeating this experiment now, to see this pattern is robust, but it's tempting to Imagine that what we're seeing here could be driven by the developmental milestones occurring as we sample these fish, onset of the innate immune system, for example. 
adaptive immunity, sexual maturity. So another thing we can do with this model is we can look at the outliers, things that don't fit the model well. And these are actually, I think, the most informative um, aspects of this approach. So the, the outliers that lie above the line significantly should be tasks that are positively selected, that the hosts are selecting irregardless of their relative abundance in the source community. Those below the line are tasks that should be negatively selected. The host is selecting against despite their commonness in the source community. And th things are they're strongly below this, the, the very different and below the, um, the model, are kind of local invasions, potentially of pathogens. We can use the model to try to putatively identify these different groups. Here's an example of how we did that. So you can see there's an example here of a putative uh, OTU number 70 that was being positively selected by the fish at day 28. An example of five different taxa that are being negatively selected by the fish at day 28. And what we can do with this now is this is an apophysis, right, that we can then test by trying to culture these individual microbes and then reintroducing them to the fish to see if they are indeed negatively or positively selected. And finally, the last thing that we can do with this model that I think is interesting we can manipulate the way we think about the source pool. So what I did previously was to assume that the, the source pool was every taxon present in fish, so basically things that can live in fish. But you could also ask, as David had asked yesterday, what if you define the source community as everything you find in the tank, so the water, the food, the walls of the tank. And so we did that for two time points. We don't have the data for all the time points yet. This is what it looks like for the first two, for day four and ten. This is the Fit of the model, if we assume the source pool is anything that can live in a fish. And this is the fit of the model if we assume the source pool is everything we find in tank water. We see a similar result if we look at the tank walls or food. And what you can see is the model doesn't fit at all in the bottom case, right? It explains none of the variation. So what, what that tells us is that, is that relative to the inside of the fish, the outside of the fish is very different. There's strong selection. No evidence for dispersal address in determining what lives in a fish. But then among fish, what de determines the variation among fish is a mix of, of drift, dispersal, and some selection. And we can now start to take this apart experimentally by asking you know, what's, you know, specifically what's driving this balance between drift, dispersal, and selection among fish. So where we're going next with this, and I'm just a few minutes here, is we're, in the long term what we'd like to do is relax our control on host genetic diversity and on the variation of the source pools across space. And the near term, what we are doing right now, is trying to better understand the nature of this unexplained variance, it's likely driven by selection due to host factors that aren't directly coded for genetically, and micro micro interactions. And we're doing this by repeating this experiment using a RAG1 mutant of the zebrafish, that is a defective adaptive immune system. We've been also trying to do this with a mutant mighty 88 that has a defective innate immune system. Let's see if we get similar patterns when we um, fit the model of the data. And then for the, the last component of selection, micro micro interactions, doing a series of experiments where we alter the sequence in which we expose the fish to particular, to particular colonists, Let's see if we had the kind of priority effects that David was talking about earlier. All right, we should talk about that in more detail, but I'm just about out of time. So I'd like to do is just thank you all for your attention. Thank Karen, who's inspired me to do this work more than anyone else, and our colleague John Rawls at the at Duke University, uh, members of the Meta Center, Karen introduced yesterday, graduate students that are responsible for the work that I just talked about, Student Rock at the National, National Institutes of Health, the Meta Center, and my new favorite supermodel. And I'm happy to take questions. Hello, our second speaker is getting his slides ready. Are any clarifying questions for Dr. Brennan? For Brennan? Yes. Margaret. Margaret. So, so um, Brennan, that was a wonderful talk. I just have a question about the variation. So you say that it goes gamma, alpha, beta, and pseudobacterium. That's right. Through the life history. That's what we've seen on average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in, um, and, and so you get this variation, and I'm I'm clear as to whether or not the variation of zebra fish is at, the, at that higher taxonomic level, because in mammals it's not there's not so much variation, as I understand it, at the higher taxonomic levels, but it rather occurs at the lower taxonomic level. 
And so could you address that? I mean, is this variation that you were talking about later in your talk more at the level of the 97% OTU? Uh, that's a great question. Sorry, I wasn't clear about that. You're exactly right. So the variation that we were fitting in the model is, is variation at the OTU level. Uh -huh. And we varied our definition of OTUs, right. but the data I presented was for 97%. Yes. And so, and so in that regard, it, are the alpha, beta, alpha, gamma, alpha, beta, fuso, is that, does that vary quite a bit? Um, it seemed like when you were talking about that, that also varies quite a bit, unlike mammals. Is that true? Yeah, it does. I mean, not the degree to which the, and Karen, correct me here if I'm wrong, the degree to which the OTUs do, but we, right. but not every, not every individual has the same progression of, at the level of class of phyla. Is that right? And there was, yeah, I mean, the field back here, I remember that was quite striking across the individual. Yeah. yeah. We'll have time for some more questions. Hopefully. Yes. Yeah. 